Uh, so is the microphone working? Yeah? Okay, good. Um, welcome, everybody, uh, and thanks for coming. Um, I'm, I'm Ned Scharf. Well, I'm Ned Scharf. I'm the president of the Athenaeum of Philadelphia. Um, I don't usually speak at these events. Uh, um, in, in, in fact, I've only done it in Beth's absence. Uh, I yield to Beth because she is the master of uh, introductions. I am not. Uh, but this evening, there, was, uh, there were a few things I wanted to say to you. Um, in my view, and I hope in, in all of yours, uh, the essence of the Athenaeum is conversation. Uh, we exist to bring interesting people together to uh, engage in meaningful and, uh, and stimulating exchange. Um, we're a membership library uh, founded in 1814 when books were rare and precious uh, and access to them was quite difficult. Um, we're an outgrowth like so many wonderful things in Philadelphia. Uh, of, of Ben Franklin and his friends sitting around in a coffee house chewing over the meaning of life. Um, in our time, books are no longer so hard to get to. Um, you can check them out here. You can check them out at the free library. You can order them from Amazon. Or you can go down to Headhouse Books and let my friend Richard load you up with all sorts of wonderful things to read. Uh, the really difficult thing about books I think, is finding other people uh, who you can talk to about them. And that is the core of what we try to do here at the Athenaeum. We want to be that place in Philadelphia for great conversation uh, about books, ideas, and things that really matter to all of us. When it comes to conversation, <clears throat> there's a line that we all have to draw between genuine exchange of ideas on one hand, and political rant on the other. Uh, conversation can excite and inspire. It can make us think. Political rant does the opposite. It's a turnoff. Uh, even when you agree with what's being said, it is shrill. It's the enemy of conversation and idea exchange. Uh, tonight is an interesting case. Um, Susan Abulawa whom Beth will introduce in a moment, is an accomplished novelist. Uh, she's a literary artist. That's my opinion. It's also the, the opinion of our Athenaeum Literary Award Committee, which shortlisted her latest novel for last year's literary award. It was up against some steep competition, and it nearly won. It happens to be a wonderful novel. Again, that's my opinion. And it's also the opinion of a good many critics who have nothing to do with the Athenaeum. Uh, it's a work of literature in the very best sense. It's a story of human suffering and human growth. Uh, the protagonist happens to be a radicalized Palestinian. What that book is not is a political rant. I, I bring this up because tonight's program has occasioned a number of hectoring phone calls from one pro-Zionist group in particular, uh, phone calls from people who had no intention of engaging in dialogue, but simply wanted to scream at us and insist that we cancel tonight's program. Uh, of course, we were not about to do that. In fact, those phone calls have made us feel all the more fortunate to have Susan and Anya with us tonight. Uh, Susan is somebody with compelling stories to tell. Uh, she's the kind of author who does provoke thought and conversation. She is a person of real literary craft. Uh, Susan's book title, Against the Loveless Wor is Against the Loveless World. But Susan, let, let me tell you, we love having you here with us tonight. Um, so thank you, and welcome to you both. So now it's my pleasure to step aside and let Beth do the introdu introducing. Welcome everyone to the Athenaeum. I, I, I think uh, Ned did a, a wonderful job in, in setting us up and reminding us what we are about here. And for all you know, books are still precious, even if they are easily available to many people in the United States, but not everybody. 
And we want everybody to be a part of this community and welcome all of you. If you enjoy what you experience tonight, we invite you to become a member and a part of, of our community of people who love books and literature and history and Philadelphia and, and all the ways that everything intertwines together and how our conversations together help us become not only better people, but a better community and a better world. Normally we end with a reception and we're so disappointed we can't do that tonight. The city of Philadelphia has a lot of stringent requirements and we're really trying to ensure that everybody stays safe. I thank all of you for getting vaccinated and, and showing that proof tonight to be here, for keeping your masks on just as that extra little step to help everyone stay, uh, to stay safe. And we're hoping soon we'll be back at the place where we can have our favorite beverage and our favorite deviled eggs or lemon bars or whatever it is in hand while we're in conversation with one another. But we invite you to stay afterwards and talk anyway, because we know it's not what we're eating while we talk, but it is what is in our hearts and our minds that we share with one another that builds the community. So thank you for being here. Hope you will stay. Not only that, the books are now out in paperback. If you have already have a book, Buy some books for people you love, people you want to love, <laughs> uh, people you want to get to know. Buy yourself a copy, and Susan will be here to sign them um, for you also. And when you see me pulling her down there at the end, please let me get her down to that table before you um, come and talk to her, because I want to make sure she can sign books for people who, who, uh, who buy their copies, or if you brought your own copy uh, to have signed, I know. Oops, I did. So it's a pleasure tonight to welcome you all and um, a, a wonderful conversation. I think Susan, for, for you as well for Anya, this is your first in person um, in, in, a, in a couple years now. So it is wonderful, it's a delight to have you here. It's, it's great to be a first for, for so many people uh, at the Athenaeum. Our guest tonight, you all know, is Susan Albahawa, who is, as Ned said, an incredible writer and a poet and an activist She's the writer of, of a number of best-selling books, Mornings in Janine, which has been translated into more than 30 languages. For those of us who would like to become a writer, it'd be great to have one in just one language, right? <laughs> but 30 languages is something else. The Blue Between Sky and Water and this most recent book, Against the Loveless World, which is now out in paperback and, and is really powerful. Um, born to refugees of the Six-Day War of 1967, Susan moved to the United States as a teenager. She graduated in biomedical science. She is one smart person and established a career in medical science. And in July 2001, she founded Playgrounds for Palestine, which is a, a, a children's organization which helps uphold the right to play for Palestinian children, which is incredibly important. And she lives in, in Pennsylvania. We actually, after we invited her to come and talk, she became almost my next door neighbor. So uh, it's, it's nice to know that that, that that brilliance is floating around in the air that I breathe in the mornings too. And in conversation with her is a, another amazing and distinguished uh, writer and thinker, Anya Lumba, who is the Catherine Bryson Chair in the English Department at the University of Pennsylvania and also faculty in comparative literature, South Asian studies, and women's studies. And she is also a well sought after speaker um, and has published quite a lot, including um, Gender, Race, Renaissance Drama, and Shakespeare, Race and Colonialism. She's co edited the Post Colonial Shakespeare. Um, that was out by Rutledge, and she also produced a critical edition of Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra. Um, and her most recent book was Revolutionary Desires, Women, Communism, and Feminism in India. If that sparks your interest, I think we may need to get you here to talk about some of your topics as well. Um, and, and so Anya will be leading the conversation. These two have a lot to talk about, but we will open it up um, before the end of the evening for all of your questions. And, and then we will have the time for you to buy books and get them signed. So we're so grateful you are all here. I invite you to join me in a warm welcome to Susan and Anya. Thank you. Yeah, I think I should move back so I don't, so I can, peep, I'm not, I don't have my back to them. Oh, I'm just gonna move a little bit back. Yeah, here. there we go. Um, so it's my distinct pleasure 
and uh, privileged to be here in this wonderful space talking with a person that I have long admired, but we've never met before this, um, except through her books. And uh, this is a remarkable book. I think it's a, uh, I, I hope that we can get into the style as well as the content of the book, because as a professor of literature, I have the pleasure of being able to talk about books and literature every day with my students, and many of them are really controversial books, and we learn to um, talk about them and disagree about them, which I think is really a privilege in today's world where it's so easy to just shut down people you don't agree with. And um, um, so I want to start us off uh, by f uh, asking, actually, Susan, to, uh, if you haven't read the book, to maybe just describe it in a few words, and then um, we were talking about a couple of passages that I think are very moving and interesting, and um, I'd like to invite her to maybe read one such passage, and if the moment is right, I might read uh, from a couple of um, very extraordinary moving passages myself later. But Susan, could you uh, just first um, tell us how you would describe, how you would describe the book? And that might be different from how I would describe the book, but I would love to hear how you would describe it. Um, well, first of all, I'm, I'm delighted to be here, and I'm really grateful for, um, for the openings and the introduction. Um, uh, it, it, it's, it's really uh, wonderful to be in a space where people understand that novels are places where human beings get to meet as, as human beings. It's, it's a wonderful terrain um, that uh, that invites us to to find common humanity. Um, against the loveless world is uh, I, was, I mean it's a Palestinian story. I find it. Um, I think it's a feminist story. I don't always. I mean I'll tell you what it's about. Um, not necessarily my interpretation of it because I think in, when it comes to interpretation, that is the exclusive domain of readers. Mm -hmm. um, I really I feel that. Uh, readers sort of complete the transaction of a novel in a way um, and and give it the life that it serves but uh, very briefly um, the protagonist is a young woman of several names she starts her life in uh, in Kuwait she was born to refugees she's very much um, a typical girl wants to get married make her friends jealous um, with her new appliances, etc. Uh, but then the Iraq, uh, the invasion, um, the occupation by Iraq happens, and then the US invasion that follows. Um, and, uh, and so she sort of, her life is set on a trajectory of refugees in the same way that her parents' life had been um, uh, set on that same trajectory of, of refugees' life. She makes her way back to Palestine eventually, um, where she, uh, her political awakening occurs, and she, um, she finds her political voice. But before that, actually, she uh, she was she gets involved in escort work and, and sex work in Kuwait. Um, so she 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 had a she had a full <laughs> full life, and in many ways, um, she's probably one of my. Um, one of my favorite characters that I've ever written, yeah. Yeah, I mean, she, um, so she has uh, her life, it seems to me, her political life and her sexual and romantic life are beautifully braided together in this book. Um, and there are moments where um, you feel that, uh, you know, she's really sexually damaged in many ways from her experience in Kuwait doing escort work, where she is, you know, maltreated, raped, um, you know, including there's a moment where she realizes that her first violation of her was by a man that she married mm -hmm. at 17. Mm -hmm. And, you know, was very attracted to him, thought he was beautiful and so on. And up until her actual political awakening, it seems that 
she hasn't found um, a, a, an expression of love, mm -hmm. um, at least with a person of the opposite sex, that can be meaningful. And it takes a very long time in the novel for that to happen. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about this, the young Nahar, before mm -hmm. her political awakening. She's still very, um, um, sh not sure of herself, but she, she's, well, she's firstly, she's naturally a, defiant. Yeah, she's yeah. defiant, but she's also a fantastic dancer. Yeah. How did you, so why, I mean, what in, you know, what made you um, focus on the dancing? Because her sexual expression, her attractiveness, uh, even, you know, it makes her vulnerable to mm -hmm. men, to predatory yeah. men, because she's such a fantastic dancer. So could you talk about dance um, yeah. and, and your sort of conception of Neher? Yeah, thank you for um, for talking. It's for bringing up that element yeah. because I, I think you know dance dancing was such an integral part of who she was, and um, it wasn't sexual to her. I mean, she was too young to really understand how it looked to others, mm -hmm. um, and her mother would all, often make her stop dancing at weddings and things like that because she was she was so sensual and she was um, without knowing it, but. She, it was her, dancing was her home. It was, it was her, um, it was her safe place. It was the only place that she felt when she felt like she had value, when she felt like people would look at her. She was, she was a terrible student. Um, they didn't have money. Uh, and she felt like this was where she could shine. And so she danced and she was very good at it in part because, um, she wasn't just moving she would she would she would blend and there's a whole chapter about how her experience of dancing and how she blends with the music and it suffuses her body and i also took that opportunity too to to um for her to comment on how it feels to watch other like the the people who have colonized your your lands and your culture and have dismissed you to see them uh, colonize your art form, your dance, and then call it something else, call it belly dance, which it's not. Okay. So there's, um, so so she has this kind of political inclination without understanding that it's mm. a political inclination. Mm. Um, and yes, she, she, uh, she does, she is damaged by sex. And, and as a matter of fact, until she, uh, until towards the very end, she, um, she isn't, she, isn't sure that men can ever be good, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, um, we, we, before we come to her political awakening, um, uh, there's another extraordinary character uh, in your book. So um, for those of you who haven't read the book, it moves through different spaces, uh, which I think is a wonderful um, move on your part, because for me, the life of understanding the life of Palestinian refugees in Kuwait, in Iraq, in Jordan, then going to Palestine, then back to Jordan again, and then, you know, the penultimate section is called Palestine always, and then the last section is called Between Freedom. So I think, you know, one of the, um, you know, when I had Palestinian friends as a young student in England, one of the things that always was puzzling to me, uh, and it took so many years to understand it, was how the lives were so multi-locational and so uh, often everybody had experienced deep unroot, unsettling and unroot, you know, being picked up from where you were and taken to another place. And this book, I think, through Neher, does it very gently. So she. Um, for example, when she moves, she loves Kuwait, mm -hmm. and when she moves <clears throat> to uh, Iraq, one of the things that Amman, Jordan, uh, to, uh, yeah, yeah, to yeah, Jordan, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah. what she hates is that she can't get, um, you know, beautiful lingerie or you know, or shoes. But then when she goes to Palestine, mm -hmm. even that place looks like, oh, I could get, you know, there was still a hairdresser there, or there was still, you know. And so slowly, it's, it seems to me that you, the dislocations that you take us through till 
she's living this almost bare life in Palestine. But then you introduce the, right, the reader to all the little signs of normality in Palestine and community mm -hmm. and love and food. Mm -hmm. um, so could you, you know, could you talk a little bit about these dislocations and, you know, how this novel is structured around them and its return, yeah. go to Palestine in return and her mother goes to Palestine and maybe you could read a section from when the mother goes to Haifa to her old house as mm. well. Yeah, when she so. goes, she visits her. Her mother isn't allowed. Oh yeah, to go, the yeah. mother isn't allowed to go. Yeah, um, yeah so that was um, dividing this book up into geographic locations uh, was intentional. And it, because that is a, uh, that's an element of Palestinian reality is this geographic fragmentation. Um, and it is, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's national. Um, in that, you know, you have uh, Palestinians in Gaza who are completely cut off from us and the rest of the world. Uh, Palestinians in, we call them 1948 Palestinians, and they are the ones who um, were able to remain in their villages and subsequently became citizens of Israel. And then you have Palestinians in the West Bank who um, are under military occupation. Um, and people in Gaza are as well. And, and then you have Palestinians in the diaspora, like myself, who are cut off from our language and our families and, and um, our roots. And you have Palestinians who are still in refugee camps in, in Lebanon. And so there's this, um, this geographic fragmentation where none of us can actually touch each other or even reach each other. Um, and it has evolved into psychological fragmentations and social fragmentations. So that part of the, you know, the, dividing this book into those sections was intentional. Um, and you always kind of feel like you're straddling, uh, multi-location is a really good term, I'm gonna use that. <laughs> um, but you always feel like you're straddling different places and never really belonging in either. And it isn't just a matter of exile, where somebody leaves their country and, and then they, you know, they go away. And they can always go back to the place where they belong and the whole family is still there. It's not that way for us. We go away and the whole family is scattered. They're scattered in, in a million different places. I mean, you know, I have like immediate family in, in Kuwait and Amman, in, uh, in Palestine, in Lebanon, in Europe. and. Um, so that's something that is, is, is deeply wounding for all Palestinians. And you know, people, uh, grandparents really never getting to see their grandchildren. Um, so uh, yeah, and, and Nahar, um, Nahar's development, her evolution as a woman, as a, um, as a, as a person, sort of evolves very differently in each location. And um, I mean, you kind of touched on that. And it's, yeah. and it's, and in some ways her evolution reflects the geographic location as well. Well, one of the things you do really well is uh, talk about both the connection and difference between Palestinian women of different generations. Uh, I found the relationship between Neher and her father's mother, mm -hmm. um, Siti Wasfi, was yeah, yeah. Um, really fantastic. So she's a woman that is not immediately lovable. She's cranky, cranky, mean. and and <laughs> her, you know, reminds us of many grandmothers. Yeah, <laughs> um, but she, you know, she is so. Um, umbilically tied to her grandchildren. Uh, and her relationship with her daughter-in-law is something, you know, I mean, how did, uh, how does Neher's mother have such re resources of love and affection for a mother-in-law who really is quite hard? And yeah. you, there is a moment in which, um, you know, we are told that she does it for her dead husband's sake. But that is not the whole truth with no, her. You never, right. you feel it, isn't? Right. You right, know. And yeah. So is is. So can you talk a little bit about how dislocation, this dislocation, yeah. also creates different kinds of 
bonds between people, you know. Um, and, yeah. Well, this is the world of women too. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's uh, it's not just Palestinians. I think, um, and it wasn't always good. She wasn't always. She didn't always. I mean, there was a moment when she grabs a knife, you know, to her and tells her she, to, you know, yeah. she's gonna cut her throat, <laughs> her, her tongue out if she doesn't stop. But um, so there was always there was tension. But yes, there's love and. Um, and I, so one of the things, and this is a recurring theme in all of my books, is, is these relationships between women. I'm, um, mm -hmm. how we, how, you know, the, the, the way we harm each other and love each other at the same time, how these relationships evolve. I mean, there's another relationship too between Om Barak, Om Barak who is Absolutely. Nahar's procurus and you know, initially she, you know, I, I, I suspect the reader would revile her. Um, but Nahar, you know, and so does Nahar, of mm -hmm. course. Uh, but she, she comes, they come to love each other and it's real and it's genuine and there's a sisterhood. And, um, and, not, and Umburak was one of those characters, and this, ha this has happened in every book. There's always a character that I intend to be a minor character who, who kind of disappears from the story early on but they have such a big personality that they, they end up suffusing the whole book. And mm -hmm. Umburak was that character in this book and I ha had to bring her back in the end because mm -hmm. that, you know, that, that's what made sense. Yeah. Um, but yeah. there's a passage you know, on page 88 that I just found myself, it could be any, it could be different communities mm -hmm. you know, of women um, and, and you know, your book is, doesn't sentimentalize the relationship between women because Um Barak and Neha's relationship, I think is something that, you know, exploitation and love mm -hmm. go very hand in hand in this book. You know, yeah. this, and, and same with Palestinian men, uh, you know, the ones in, who are mm -hmm. actually um, on the, you know, so exploitative of Neher, um, are are Palestinian men. So there is no, you know, what I loved about it was that at one level, the gender, um, you know, Um Barak says it, never trust men, never trust men. And her, that rings through her head so many times when she's creating new relationships in Palestine and, yeah. you know, looking at them. But there's this passage that I, I just, I don't know, it, it felt beautiful, almost daily, Mama and Siti Wasife. Could you yeah, read sure. that, please? Um, so just to, just to preface this um, scene, this, this is during the uh, Iraq's occupation of Kuwait. And I think um, this is a really good passage, I think, to read to an American audience because I think people's conception of the occupation is not what it was on the ground for everyone. Um, and so this is, this is how it happened for Nahar and her family. Our lives became wonderfully simple clearer somehow in the fog of occupation. Folks with money, the creditors and the landlords, had fled the country, leaving the rest of us, the rest of us with a new freedom to exist. We didn't have to pay rent for six months. No one was there to collect it. Almost daily, Mama and Siti Wasfiya would gather with the women in our building who remained in Kuwait. They'd bake bread ra rather than wait in the bread lines. Despite the uncertainty, people socialized without the weight of financial responsibilities. Iraq's occupation had the effect of a natural disaster. It allowed us to take a break from the contrived necessities of money. There was a deeply felt dignity in the sense that one's shelter and sustenance were not mortgaged. We went, we went where we could not have afforded before the invasion, walked into homes where, where we'd never have been invited and into establishments that would not have welcomed us during normal times. No one was poor, no one was rich, we just were. And we shared. We ate, we drank, we laughed, we danced, we cried. We dreamed and imagined a better world. Then we waited for fate to fall on our heads from American warplanes. Newspapers and television pundits spoke of the United States military buildup in Saudi Arabia but I could not imagine war. I thought it only happened in far away, uh, in f far away in quote, war zones, deep in the desert or beyond the orange cones bobbing in the ocean where swimmers were not allowed to go. 
I was a daughter of refugees chased out of their homes in Palestine, not once but twice, yet I could not conceive of bullets and bombs coming so close. But as time passed, the louder and more animated the pundits became. People who previously spoke only in whispers now spoke openly about the United States destroying Iraq. On the other hand, those who had been emboldened by Saddam Hussein began to shrink. Then they began to flee. Thank you. Um, so when Nahar goes, I mean, there are two things I, I would like to talk about. You could do it in any um, order. One is these photographs that Nahar's mother has of her home. Um, and they're just black and white, and we have a, you know, they become more real when Neher, she revisit, revisits them several times. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, the mother goes to Palestine, comes back, and doesn't really tell Neher everything that has happened. And then Neher goes to Palestine, and then ends up going to Haifa to visit the mother's home. and. That's a moment where I think she, her political awareness is growing, but it's not fully formed. But it's through moments like this that I think it does catapult into a different determination. No, she's already mm -hmm. that 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 angry yeah. nature of hers is now taking a different direction. Right. I feel to me. So maybe you could read from. Sure. When she goes to that home, I, again, a wonderful moment. Yeah, so she had already been in Palestine and, um, and she, because her mother would not talk about what happened when she went to visit her old home in Haifa, um, Nahid was very curious and so she embarks on that and, and uh, uh, I didn't, I don't know where you wanted me to stop by the way. Oh, where you wanted me to start or stop? Stop, yeah. Did you have that marked? What page is it? Again? It's 161. Anya, by the way, is the one who picked these awesome passages. So <laughs> it's like, it could be anywhere. Okay. Um, okay um, I haven't visited this in a long you're time. You're going to have to read uh, till 163. Okay. Shock admiration. Okay. Is that too much to read? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't think so. It's, it depends on you guys. <laughs> I think it gives a flavor of the book and then we can talk, you know. I walked up to the wooden gate. The indentation where the plaque had been was still visible if you knew what to look for. I thought about walking around to the entrance and knocking on the door, but the decrepit gate beckoned me. I stepped into the lush space of our absence. These were the trees my great-grandfather had planted for his children and grandchildren. My grandfather would have planted some for me and jihad had our destiny not been stolen. I began walking among these tree those trees, looking for the carvings my mother had told me about, but I saw none. At the far edge of the garden was a sycamore fig tree. It bore red fruit close to the bark, unlike the green and brown figs I'd imagined. I looked around before hiking, uh, hiking myself up on its trunk uh, to pick one. I was, it was fragrant and much sweeter than regular figs. I climbed as best I could, grabbing fistfuls of fruit and tucking them into my purse as I searched for evidence that this was my mother's tree. A commotion in the street distracted me. I grabbed one last bundle of figs. On the branch where the fruit had been were jagged lines. I pulled away some vines and more fruit to reveal the rest. The noise from the street was growing louder as I made out the words, Rashida. Habibit Baba, Rashida, Daddy's girl. That's how my grandfather had referred to my mother. This was her fig tree. This tree was a member of my family. I belonged to it. All the trees in that garden were my family. The noise from the street was now upon me, a middle-aged woman screaming at me in Hebrew. I began climbing down, fruit still in my hand. Bucket was trying to reason with her in Hebrew, at the same time imploring me to hurry up. She called the police, hurry, he warned me in Arabic. Just as I touched the ground, the woman slapped the fruit from my hand and yanked me by my hair. Unthinkingly, I punched her, then again and again. 
She was what we used to call in my school days a princess, someone who had no idea how to fight. I wanted to beat her bloody for taking away our trees, for pulling the land from under us. But Beckett caught my arm and dragged me away, and we ran together to his car. Neighbors were just beginning to gather and might have overtaken us had we left a moment later. Adrenaline pumped through us as we drove away, slowly, as if we were an ordinary Jewish couple going about our day, just in case we crossed paths with the police. When we were far enough away, convinced we had escaped detection, I rolled some figs I pulled some figs from my purse, and we laughed in a way that was somewhat deranged and euphoric. You beat the shit out of that woman. Good thing this car has hot plates so they can't trace it to me, Bucket said. I turned to him with shock, admiration, and renewed adrenaline of realizing how much deeper the trouble we escaped could have been. What? Bilal didn't tell you? We steal, we steal these motherfuckers' call, cars all the time and mix up their plates, Bucket said, laughing proud of doing his part to make the lives of the colonizers a little less convenient. We continued to revel in the thrill of return, escape, and figs. I thought about that woman, the commotion that preceded our, frust our confrontation. What was she saying anyway, I asked Bucket. She started out nice, thinking I was Jewish, but wanting to know what I was doing there parked on the side of the road. I told her I was just admiring the houses because I was thinking of moving into the area. I did my best to sound Jewish, but they can tell from the way we talk, or how we stand, or whatever. So she started getting louder, telling me to leave before she called the police. She accused me of plotting to rob her house. She asked if the, if the Arab woman sent me. I didn't know what she meant. But apparently an Arab woman came by a couple of months ago claiming that her child, this was her childhood home. Then she, what else did she say about the Arab woman? I interrupted him, that she was a terrorist. Apparently the Arab woman saw the gate open and helped herself into the garden. The Jewish woman found her, found her there crying and uh, well, you can imagine the scene. I'm sure the Arab woman left in tears. So I'll stop there. That's yeah. obviously your mother. Yeah. Um, and so I wanted to talk about you to talk a little bit about Neher's political growth. It's a, I think, a very hard thing to depict someone um, growing in that way with a lot of anger but also what she has now experienced, I think is different ways of having sustainable, loving relationships, even in the middle of occupation. And I think that for me was very um, moving because you realize that when you're living under a constant threat and constant tension, you can end up becoming really I mean, really very, very bitter and not unable to have human relationships almost. Um, and we know because the book ends, uh, well, it starts uh, with her in prison where she's absolutely alone. And I mean, that's a really hard, those passages are very hard to read, her prison passages, at least for me, because of her youth and the uh, harsh conditions in, in prison. Um, but juxtaposed with that is, I felt, uh, as she learns, you know, political commitment, she also learns love. And the way that is braided together, I think, is what makes this book a learning experience for people, you know. So it's not just the growth, it's not just, a, you know, that she's a revolutionary who wants to now go and change the world, but it is a revolutionary who has also learned ways of being with people, you know, through the mother, her ex-mother-in-law, uh, who is such an important person, through Bilal, but also all these friends, Jumana, the, you know, it's a different way of relating to people her own age almost, which she didn't have um, in, in Jordan or anywhere else, yeah. and, you know. So, so I, I think, um, I think true revolution, um, true revolutionaries are 
um, are people who love deeply. Yeah. And I, I, you know, Che Guevara uh, said once that at the core of revolution, and I'm paraphrasing, is is a deep is a deep commitment to love. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, in my mind, that makes sense. I also think that I don't. Um, I disagree that uh, it's it, like finding love is something exceptional under these circumstances or rare. I think it's exactly the opposite. I, mm -hmm. I think circumstances of, the, of oppression actually um, spur very deep relationships. Um, re a kind of depth that I actually don't always see in different circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So, and and it, there is even even with people, you know, th there's just this sort of baseline um, solidarity. Uh, you know, sometimes you, I mean, you see it uh, with Black America. You know, mm -hmm. in the way, just you know, th they just call each other brother and sister. That's mm -hmm. the baseline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's, I mean, they're, they're they're a full society, but there's this baseline kinship. That you don't see in in society in dominant societies that have never known um, collective oppression or uh, co you know colonialism. So um, mm. so yeah, and I and I think I think there's a there's a there's a different kind of love that that sometimes develops when when your lives are literally threatened, mm -hmm. when you know when you have when you have been injured when you uh, when you do have to sort of so the 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 the, the man that um, Nahad eventually falls in love with himself is a is a revolutionary and a freedom fighter and he too is physically damaged um, he you know he's he's been tortured and uh, and something that you know isn't really talked about a lot a lot of the torture in Israeli prisons occurs on men's genitalia and he was damaged in that way and and she and her whole life she never had uh i mean sex had just she'd never had a a, a loving um fulfilling sexual experience and it had been quite the opposite sex had been um traumatizing in different ways um and so I, you know, writing the, 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 the way that the connection evolves between the two of them was so um, fulfilling to me as a writer because it did have to unfold, um, it, it, you know, in, in a way that is not what you see in Hollywood. Their sexual encounter, uh, when it finally happens, is not you know this like, like sort of Hollywood scene where you know everything fits and everything works and you know um, yeah and it, it it's there were a lot of stops and starts and stops and starts and uh, and it was awkward and messy and it, and it somehow made their connection deeper and more intimate mm -hmm. um, and so I you know I love that I I like how yeah that unfolded yeah as a pattern I have to say that. Um, you know, when she goes to Palestine and he picks her up and then he's he's very welcoming, but, she, you know, she's often on the wrong foot with him. I have to say, I loved it because it was like a romance novel to me. You know, like the man is sardonic and he's slightly out of reach and you don't know how he reads you. So I actually think that in many ways, um, it actually does fulfill, it, it did for me. Uh, you know, a kind of um, romantic fantasy in some ways with, of course, um, the moments that it is shattered are the moments where you're reminded constantly of where the tension is coming from. So, for example, when she discovers that he's been spying on her mm -hmm. because they can't trust her. And so I guess that's what I was saying, that of course love, you know, when you are underground. Um, and so in my book, Revolutionary Desires, I was going back to the generation of in Indian women who had fought against colonialism with left-wing movements and so on. And of course those bonds are very deep, but, but I think the pressure that also puts on you is that you can have fracture, you can have betrayals. Mm -hmm. And that does come out in the novel by, by how careful these young people have to be. Mm. And I was kind of, you know, I was always expecting a major betrayal from someone. 
Uh, but when it comes, it isn't a betrayal from within. Mm -hmm. It's a, you know, it's an assault from outside. But I think you do get at some of the ways in which it isn't easy to simply just bond together and be together simply because you you know uh, mm -hmm. that, that it costs a lot mm -hmm. that bonding and there's a constant distrust even between women even between yeah. Jum Jumana Jumana and, and, yeah, yeah. and and her so would you say would, i mean i was kind of surprised that they weren't more like i expected a betrayal from within the community mm -hmm. so would you say that you just I d didn't want, you know, you don't want to go there uh, because because you want to focus on what is going on from outside. Yeah, it's was funny that, was because that a decision? it's funny because my um, uh, my publisher wanted that too. Oh, really? And yeah. um, and I and you know that's a, to me that's such a white gaze mm -hmm. kind of thing, and that mm -hmm. and that's not healthy. I mean, so the, the, this was we do talk. I mean, the the characters do talk about. Um, Joe Assis or like spies, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, people within the community who uh, who are traitors, and they're very careful about that. And yeah. the thing is, like, it to, to have betrayals from within is actually really, really rare. Now, there's like, if you have a group of trusted friends in yeah. Palestine yeah. who are in a re in you know who who are who are part of a resistance. It's you know to have somebody in that group betray you in, in such a profound way is just it's not real and that's not that's not yeah. reality. But yeah. that is that's a Hollywood kind of <laughs> uh, it's very Hollywood you yeah. know to yeah. kind of do that. Yeah. So um, mm. and uh, I yeah so I it, it wasn't real. But the, the thing is sometimes you know these outside pressures sort of. Um, like I said, they they make friendships more cohesive, and when um, uh, th there was a, there was one of you know one of the twins, there was some worry even within the group that he might flip, you know. Yeah. So there was that there was yeah. that tension, um, but it didn't happen. And so, um, can we talk about male female relationships within the group? One of the things that I found very um, sort of fantastic to follow is and and again one of those two brothers the the, the tension came from mm -hmm. because he was in love with someone who yeah. is not quite in in the group mm -hmm. but for Bilal for the hero too I mean for the main protagonist the moment he thinks that Neher is pregnant uh, he wants her to leave spoiler alert <laughs> <laughs> I, so we won't say what happened. Okay, I'm saying yeah. he wants it. Yeah. Okay, we won't talk about that. But <laughs> no, because I, I think it's it's uh, so. But let's let's go to the moments of danger. So there's a moment where they're reading James Baldwin together, and mm -hmm. you know, Baldwin says, "To be committed is to be in danger," and I thought that was absolutely the reality of um, people fighting in conditions such as you know Palestinians and now I have to say I feel you know that the parallels with other parts of the world are becoming more and more stark as we are seeing so you know my husband is from Kashmir which is mm. occupied uh, and uh, it's very differently occupied but I just think that just it's as not brutally, though. Just as brutally, and uh, frankly, you know, I am not from Kashmir. I'm from India. But now, with Modi's government, we are all in danger. Everybody's in danger. And so, being in the United States is, you know, people keep saying, "Oh well, now you can become an American citizen. You'll be safe." But what I wanted to talk to you about was like the connection with, you know, what your novels speak to people from other, you know, there are other places where um, I think Palestine has a kind of a resonance for people. I was speaking to Kashmir University students yesterday and the moment I mentioned Palestine, I, you could just see uh, like a recognition that this is where we are living now, you know, and they've taken a lot of hope from the resistance in Palestine as well. So I think the resistance and the movement mm -hmm. and uh, the incredibly difficult circumstances under which it is conducted, it, I mean, what, what would you, you know, do you think that resonates 
you know, with communities in the United States who are, you, you keep drawing, you know, the Baldwin passage asks us very much to make these connections mm -hmm. uh, with, with what's happening in, in the United States. Yeah. Maybe you could, I would like you to just address that at a philosophical level because we could keep discussing the plot and the characters and I'm eager to do that because Neher is unforgettable. Um, she is really unforgettable. But, and before we come back to that, could we just talk a little bit about yeah, yeah. Um, those social movements. Um, I want to point out too that the title of this book um, comes from a James Baldwin passage in that same uh, uh, in that same you know passage where he's it's from a letter to his uh, to, to little James, his nephew. Um, uh, yeah. So Bilal, like I said, is a revolutionary, and I think that is. Um, understanding these sort of global connections and connecting the dots um, is is something that true revolutionaries do and seeing the patterns and seeing that um, how how one's oppression is connected to the oppression of others and um, so many struggles uh, that have been won have have much to owe to the solidarity of, of other movements. Um, you know, the Palestinian resistance movement uh, began um, in, at a time when there were leftist resistance movements throughout the world, and they were all intertwined. What, you know, it was the, um, the ANC and the PLO, um, the, you know, freedom movements, uh, freedom movements throughout, throughout Africa, um, throughout Asia, uh, during the, you know, some of you probably remember the non-aligned, <laughs> yeah. non-aligned movement. Um, so I think, you know, making these, the, these connections is vital to everyone's uh, resistance and everyone's struggle. After, uh, after the Ferguson or during the Ferguson uprising, there was this, uh, wonderful moment of solidarity and cohesion between the protesters and Ferguson on the ground and Palestinians and they were connecting via Twitter and it empowered both groups in a way that um, that that profoundly affected both mm -hmm. both struggles mm -hmm. and um, and so you know Bilal understands this and Bilal is a student of history he's a reader Nahed wasn't a reader. Yes. Um, Nahed was, you know, Nahed wanted to, to open a salon. She was into beauty and she was into um, things that lived on the surface. And uh, but it was through him that she, you know, through through the that he read to her, and then she read to him, and they read together, and that was part of their um, that was part of how they fell in love. Um, but she did internalize those things, and mm -hmm. and she and Bald, reading Baldwin as well as Ghassan Kanafani and Franz Fanon and a few others, um, she internalized the, the those works, and that was a huge part of her own political evolution. Okay. Shall we take some questions from the audience? Yeah, with, with, um, you know, and discussion. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so the uh, we didn't really talk much about the cube, but I yeah, know. just I also <laughs> didn't want to give away what happens. But, but, it, yeah, the, but the cube is great. The, yeah. As I said, this, the the book is broken up in se into several sections um, ge that you know are based on geography. But the first chapter of each section is a flash uh, is a is you know flash forward in time when Nahed sits in a prison cell. It's an isolation cell. It's highly techno. Um, it's just fully automated, and, and she forms relationships with her shower and her, you know, the toothbrush and the, the spiders and things like that in her cell. Um, and that I wasn't initially sure how the, that, that structure sort of emerged, and in, 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 uh, you know, just through rewriting. As a matter of fact, the whole novel emerges in rewriting. I think. 
the early drafts are complete crap. I'd be really embarrassed for anybody to read them. But um, so I had you know different chapters, and I wasn't sure how to intersperse them and and where the right moment was. Um, and then I you know when I tried it that way, it just it worked. I mean that was just a matter of like. Um, trial and error. Does this work here? And how? So that there wasn't some great genius behind it or anything. <laughs> it's just you know planning. Um, yeah. Um, so, you know, if you consider our lives, like you exist in a world where all of those things coexist in your, in your life and, and maybe they don't all affect you simultaneously in one moment, but when you move through the world as a woman, um, you know, you, you, you bump into them and that's, so, and I, I think, you know, a novel, um, a no, like novels that distill things too much and essentialize things or sentimentalize things aren't appealing to me. And so I, you know, I, the things that I read are um, in some ways, you know, they, they mimic life. They, uh, um, there aren't tidy endings. There aren't, you know, perfect closure to everything. I mean, that's not life to me. And, uh, and that's, that's how I write. That's what I, that's what I gravitate towards as a reader. And that's how, what I gravitate towards as a writer. Um, in terms of how the technicalities, I can't tell you, I don't know. All I can say is that, um, I, the early drafts really are crap. I mean, I wasn't really, jo I wasn't joking. And and I don't, and I, I kind of get to know the characters, and I, um, I don't know what's going to happen. When I write, I start with a seed, and I just, and I just write, and I'm moving through the world with these characters, and I'm bumping into things as they bump into them, and I, and at some point in the rewriting process, the the characters tell their own story, mm -hmm. and um, and I just kind of get out of the way, and if that makes sense. But I know what you mean. It's like, uh, and, and, and the um, homosexuality, I mean, Neher's first the understanding as she's explaining mm -hmm. to that, that young boy that we are all some ways bisexual. Yeah. But she herself is surprised. Yeah. With the spectrum. She's talking to him and she's realizing that she believes this as she's talking to him. I thought that was amazing. So she doesn't begin, and I think the novel doesn't begin with the formula. I felt that very much, just as Neher herself doesn't know what she thinks, and when she's talking about it, she discovers it. I felt that the novel proceeds like that, and kind of proceeds yeah. through her consciousness in one way. Um, I don't know if you felt that, but I, that's one of the things I enjoyed about it very much, because you don't know which way it's going to go. Yeah, yeah. That's an interesting question, and I, it's not something that I've thought about. Um, I've, I, I haven't written anything where uh, the the uh, a male character was the 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 principal protagonist. I mean, in Mornings in Janine, um, even though the, the story is all, essentially the story of three siblings, two boys, two men, and, and a woman. Um, and though Amal is the one who, who sort of narrates most of the book, but they are strong characters and, and 
important protagonist. But I, I, I think that um, I'm not, I don't really gravitate towards that. So I don't know, I don't know if I can either. I mean, I think sometimes, um, I mean, just, I, I, I gravitate more towards the complexity of women and, uh, and the relationships that they form with the world. I think it would be interesting, though, to, to at least attempt it. And, um, <laughs> but I feel like women's stories haven't really been told enough. You know, men have occupied so much space um, for so long. And I know even this generation might see things differently because there's a lot of female writers and, and but um, among those female writers, there aren't, I mean, there, there aren't a lot, of, a lot of women who get celebrated in the way that men have. And um, it's just, it's, it's still kind of, it's still young in, in, in the history in, of, of literature and who gets celebrated and who gets awards. And I mean, there's some, there's some quantitative, um, you, you probably know this better than I do. I mean, there's uh, studies that have quantified the, um, the number of uh, prizes that have gone to men in the mm -hmm. last 20, 30 years versus women the number of major books that had a male protagonist versus a female protagonist. I mean, and, and the data is so skewed. And these are just simple, um, just simple measurements, you know, just, you know, in terms of prizes, celebrated books by male authors versus female authors, male protagonist versus female protagonist. And the numbers are staggering. So there's a real disparity. And um, I very instinctively kind of, uh, always go with the underdogs <laughs> and that's what I'm interested in um, and even books that represent women of color oftentimes represent women of color who, who are of a certain class mm -hmm. rarely are they about uh, the working class as protagonists of color and that I mean that's not it's, I mean, if you, if you really do, a, do a, a study on it, you'll find that th they're not there. Um, they're still muted. And so, so I'm not, I guess I'm just not as interested, I think. <laughs> Does the, yeah. He has a pretty great female character, yeah. <laughs> I have to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm just wondering whether a really feminist um, novel could be written where the protagonist was male. You know, possibly it could, mm -hmm. but I would agree that um, you know you well statistically you, you get much more literature. Uh, so I teach a class called Narrative Across Cultures, and I said it should be short books because this is an introductory class, and. I have to really um, search hard to put books there which fit the criteria and yet are written by women because if you want to cover through the ages and periods, you do realize that you have to start by saying, I'm going to find them and then you'll come across it, you know, because yeah. uh, and then you have to, so absolutely. But, and what I think with this book, what you do is you give us women from different generations, that's what I loved. Because there are two old women who are so full of life, and then there are women of every generation who are, yeah. uh, you know, the mother and Um Barak must be this, roughly the same generation, yeah. and they're there. <laughs> so it's full of women. It's not just there. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's, it's very full. How but Indian you, culture yeah. is like that too. I mean, yeah. I, you know, we, I mean, that's. Yeah. Well, I th that's, this makes me feel at home, the yeah. book. I mean, that, that's the other thing, I think. That, because, yeah. yeah, in our cultures, yeah. um, the generations coexist together. Oftentimes, it's in the same house, you know? Mm -hmm. we, like, in our, in our society, um, kids don't move out of the house when they're 18 and go do their own. I mean, they, they just, when they get married, they get another, uh, they get the, uh, uh, another story you built on the house for them yeah. so they can have some privacy. Yeah. But the family stays together, and you yeah. always have... 
um, multiple generations occupying the same space and everybody's raising everybody else's kids. And so, I mean, that was actually why that passage that you read out where they all did everything to, I mean, that is a passage of extraordinary, a different, difficult moment. It's not representative, but one of the things that is um, struck me at least is that there are so, it's so full of people and communities Every household, this is exactly what comes out. And I found myself a bit envious. And I was like, then nobody's lonely. I mean, they're, they're oppressed, they're angry, they're miserable, they're torn, they're agonized. I mean, all kinds of things happen. And they fight amongst each other too. Oh, and yeah. there's jealousies and yeah. scandals and stuff, uh, but yeah. But you know, I kept thinking that one difference in, in all the multiple locations that this book goes to is that they're not lonely. Yeah. And I wondered if that's a choice that you're conscious of that. You want to actually write that in the sense of that wasn't a no, no. I wasn't thinking that it's, it's nobody's a, lonely, but I, but I think it's probably a subconscious thing. Yeah, I, you know, I th because I I feel that intensely here in the United States because I'm yeah. so I'm I'm I've been severed from my family, um, and so I think you know in me there is this longing to go back yeah. and to be yeah. in that milieu. I don't know if you feel that, but I mean, I, I, yeah. how can you not? Yeah. But. However alternative worlds we make, I think it's also a cultural difference, which is being eroded, you know, with modernity coming in different ways in different places. But I felt so at home with the book, with the food, and, and I thought, <laughs> am I just being hopelessly nostalgic? But that, there's nothing wrong with that. I think the, it filled a gap in me, you know, living alone with my husband in Philadelphia. I'm like, wow, all these people in and out, the neighbors bringing food, you know, in yeah, well, they of do prices. that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely. Um, and they do that in Philadelphia too, in certain parts of Philadelphia, but, yeah, but of we, course these, do, yeah. these are things we, I think, uh, what the book does is also ask you to make a community. Yeah. I mean, yeah. for me, it's not just, a, yeah, I know we're out of time, but. Okay, I was just like, I think you have a question here. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Um, so, for those of you who haven't read it, Nahid has multiple names. I think I said that early on. Um, she, so her, she's born, um, her mother wanted to name her Nahid, but her father when her mother's in labor, he comes to the hospital and he writes Yaqut on the, um, on the birth certificates. And Yaqut was his lover, at, his mistress at the time. And he, you know, he arrives slightly, you know, drunk and he, uh, so she, and then there's, you know, big fight ensues between, between them. But so she, starting out, she has two names and her mother, of course, refuses to call her by the name on the birth certificate. Um, so she starts out as Yaqut and Nahir, which in the book you'll see had an element of fate to it because it helped her evade um, uh, Kuwaiti police um, after the U.S. invasion. But then when she becomes um, she becomes a sex worker, she she takes on Umburak, you know, insists that all her girls uh, have you know different names, and so she takes on the name Almas. Um, and her brother, her little brother, couldn't pronounce her name when she was young, when he was a baby, and so he called her Nanu. So she has these multiple names and identities, and um, she she kind of, you know, having these different names for her allow her to go into a different persona. And when she's done with that, she erases the name. And you know, at some point, she stop, she gets rid of Almas, and mm. and in doing, you know. Removing that name uh, is is kind of, I you know I hate this word closure, but closure on that kind of on that, that part life. of herself. Yeah. 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 yeah.
your the the videos of some of the the book talks you've given el elsewhere and every single one is different because of the nature of the questions of the moderator and where you are at and re reflecting and questions we ask and so um, this has really been a special moment and I think for all of us who haven't had the opportunity to really gather in person much in the last few years to be able to be in the same room with an author that we love is really special and so let's all thank Susan and Anya for being here thank you thank you and um, Carly with Head House Books has copies of the book back there. Please do buy some for yourself, again, for people you think have got to read this book, you want to be in conversation with about it, and uh, Susan will, will sign the copies back there. Thank you for coming, and we hope to see you at future, including tomorrow night. We have a first Friday, so you are welcome to come. We have um, several artists who are being featured. I don't have my paper in front of me to tell you who, but... Um, Fantastic art, conversation, and fun. So I invite you to come back tomorrow evening, 5 to 7. Thank you for being here.